um, who uh, can't get in, um, can listen to it afterwards. So anyway, um, I wanna thank um, all of those who, um, and okay, Ruth, I'm gonna let you manage the check-ins now. Got it. So, um, and I will close this. This is the first time I'm using a registration process for Zoom. So uh, sorry for any, um, any malfunctions, but um, uh, we have a group called International Feminist, Feminist Women of Istanbul. And every, uh, every month we watch a, usually a documentary or sometimes a series, um, usually having to do with, you know, kind of heady subjects. And when we saw Stray, um, we all wanted to watch that. So um, we arranged a little session for us to, to view that. And um, I also had the pleasure of attending the private screening um, that was done with Elizabeth and Amit uh, about a month or so ago. And I thought it would be really great if we can get them to come. So we opened the Q&A part um, up to them. So we have about an hour and uh, based on Elizabeth's schedule, the way we wanted to do it was spend a half hour um, asking questions about the movie and then another half hour asking questions to, um, to Amit. Um, we've got some questions that were submitted uh, from our group that we will I will call on people to ask their questions first and then um, open it up to the public after that. So, um, so you know, want to thank our guest speakers. Um, we are very, very happy to have Elizabeth, uh, the director of Stray, and she's uh, phoning in, zooming in from Hong Kong right now. So um, just a little bit about Elizabeth. She's an award-winning filmmaker whose work has been showcased internationally, including at Sundance Film Festival, the Museum of Modern Art, Tribeca, New York Times Opdocs, uh, Field of Vision, and PBS's Point of View, just to name a few. She's been featured in Filmmaker Magazine's 25 New Faces of Independent Film, um, Khan's Lions, uh, Lions New Director Showcase, New York Film Festival, uh, as well as some others. And she has award-winning short films, including Hotel 22, Bison Head, um, and they've been released for distribution to educational institutions and libraries around the world. She graduated with a BFA, it was a Bachelor of Fine Arts, Mm -hmm. um, from NYU to School of the Arts, as well as a um, master's in that from Stanford. So this is her, Stray is her um, uh, debut feature documentary and it won the top jury prize at Hot Docs International Film Festival and was nominated for Independent Spirit Award and Critics' Choice Award after premiering at Tribeca Film Festival in 2020. And it was released theatrically by, Magnolia Films um, this year. And Amit is the president of HITAP, which is the Animal Rights Federation of uh, Turkey. He's an uh, Istanbul-based attorney. And the federation is the first group to bring together associations for nature, uh, the environment, and the animal rights um, all in the same place to um, help promote um, raise public awareness regarding the violation of nature and animal rights. Um, they file suits against animal abuse, they conduct training and they do PR to get the best uh, laws in place that are possible. So appreciate anybody that is attending this session. Um, if you'd like to make a contribution to High Top, uh, I've, I've included the link here. So, I am going to stop sharing now so I can see everybody, which is much better. And uh, hello to all my friends out there and some people, yeah, like Ali Danish who I've lived here 10 years and we haven't actually had a chance to see each other. So, yay. 
So let's start with a question for Elizabeth. Um, how did this film come about? Like what got you interested in um, the strays of Istanbul? Um, so originally I wanted to do a global study of stray dogs around the world because I was interested in how a single species can, their status can change in different cultural contexts. And the countries I was looking at were Turkey, um, Russia, uh, Costa Rica, and, and several others. And it was when I started reading about Turkey's history, which is really fascinating with, with stray dogs that Ahmet has also talked about in other panels I've been with him on. Um, there are very different versions, but one of the versions that I found very compelling was a British diplomat had came to Istanbul in 1910. Uh, he tripped because he fell, um, fell to his own death after being chased by a pack of dogs. And so in retaliation, the British government forced uh, the Ottoman one to uh, round up all of their stray dogs and banish them to an island where they starved to death. Um, and the Turkish people saw that as a curse on Istanbul and the country. And so over the next hundred years, even as uh, the government has tried to eradicate stray dogs in this attempt to modernize and conform to Western standards of what an ideal city is, the people like Ahmet, um, through an animal rights movement that I'm sure Ahmet can talk more about, has been has fought and protested and somehow passed these groundbreaking laws where stray dogs are protected um, from being killed and euthanized, at least under the law, and also are prevented from being, a, being rounded up and kept in captivity. And so I was really struck by this and wanted to go to Turkey to document this for the world because it was something that was so alien to the cultures that I've grown up in, which is in Hong Kong and the States that have a much different relationship with, with dogs, especially. That's one based purely on ownership. And if you're not owned, then you're destroyed for the most part. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn it out to Shannon. She had a question about the filming, um, how it was actually filmed. Shannon, are you here? There yes, you. I yeah. am, can you hear me? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a number of us actually had questions about the filming at dog level without the dog seeming to notice you and, and pay attention to you. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how far away you were, how you accomplished that. Yeah, I'm also curious, have most people seen the film here? I heard there were problems accessing it in Turkey. Yeah, so I, I, most people I, I, haven't seen yeah. it. I think the you know Americans and British people were able to access it through their you know American and British accounts. Um, oh, okay. But I know some of the uh, Turkish people might not have been. And yeah, I mentioned that it will be available on the, this new app called Gain. That's yeah, that was the right? distribution in Turkey that we have. So if you're Turkish and haven't been able to watch it, you'll be able to see it soon on on Gain, this mobile app for documentaries. Um, in terms of how we filmed with the dogs, uh, what was something that I was really struck by when I came to Istanbul, mm -hmm. not knowing what it would be like to film with stray dogs, wondering how dangerous it would be, was that a lot of the dogs that we encountered in the city, especially in the city center, were very well socialized. Zaytan was as friendly with me as she was with every other person in the city. And so it was very easy to form a somehow a friendship with her in which she tolerated the camera. Um, and I knew that of course it was really important to film from their height because I wanted to literally uh, and sort of viscerally challenge un your conventional modes of seeing to sort of decenter the narrative away from uh, a human dominated one. And so we had a contraption that allowed me to hang the stabilizer and the camera off of my waist and I would follow the dogs crouched low throughout the day. And for some reason, they were just very tolerant of me. And I don't really have an explanation. Perhaps they were aware of what I was doing, but yeah. That's Thank great. you. <laughs> um, Rachel, you had a question about how the dogs were picked. How did, where's Rachel? Yeah, you're muted, you're muted. Did you, did you pick, how did you pick the dogs and um like there i was surprised by their territory like how much territory they covered in the city 
So at one point I was like, wait, is this the same dog covering this much territory? And then also um, I noticed that they looked like they weren't, um, the, was it sorry? The, that would look like he was not the, I guess not Zayton, but anyway, I don't remember the names. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Nazar or Kartal. One of them doesn't look like he was um, tagged, but the other one did. So I was yeah. going to ask about the tagging. Um, um, yeah, so with Zayton and Nazar, I picked them partly because they had this on and off again relationship with the young Syrian men who are sharing the streets with them. And, and it was, I was really moved by the bond that these homeless teens had with the dogs, because it was very clear to me, had it not been for the dogs, the young men would have felt much more adrift in this city that is not yet their own because they're from Syria. Um, and, and one of the things that made Zayton stand out as a star was that she was so at ease in front of the camera and also really stubborn and independent. So I couldn't manipulate her or orchestrate where I wanted to film or dictate where she should go because most dogs were quite flexible, but she wasn't. And that quality is what made me want to follow her because she fulfilled that promise of enveloping audiences in a non-human will that was not imposed by me. Um, and in terms of the tagging, um, I'm sure later on we'll be able to explain more, but when I filmed with Zayton in 2018, she didn't have a tag yet, but when I went back a year and a half later, I saw she had a tag, which must have meant in between she was neutered and, and, or spayed and then also vaccinated. Um, and I think that's a process that the city's authorities go through slowly, working their way through all the dogs. Um, so every dog, some of them were not, and some were. And, and I saw over the course of Zayton's life that she does get tagged eventually in her ear by that's the government. Really, that's a good point that you bring up. So can you explain your time frame of doing this? Because you did come, go and come back. Yeah, I filmed in 2017 first just to see if this idea had any legs um, because I wanted to look at humanity through the eyes of dogs. Um, and so I spent a month in Turkey at first traveling all across Turkey, trying to find which settings and cities were the most compelling. And I, in the end, I landed on Istanbul being the most dynamic place where the protections around dog felt the most progressive, where the relationship felt the most intimate. Um, in the way they're treated. And then in 2018, I came back for six months and filmed uh, following the dogs day and night, and then came back again in 2019 for about two weeks, just following Zayton. And I was really amazed that Zayton, people were really amazed, people who are not from Turkey were very amazed that I somehow managed to find this single stray dog out of this huge metropolis, which I think is so much a testament to how Turkish people or at least Istanbulites care for their dogs and, and, and tolerate them in a way that is unusual compared to cities like New York or Los Angeles or Hong Kong. So you just but Ahmet will be able to tell you a lot more of the nuances in that statement because he, he's, he's dealing with that work on the ground every day. So you just went back to the neighborhoods where yes. yeah, I just went back was passed around? Yeah, because she, she hangs out along Karakoy and, and Taksim Square. And so I just kind of went to the, her fa what I knew to be her favorite cafes and found her pretty easily. Her, her favorite cafes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, so you mentioned the Syrian boys. Peter had a question about those boys. Peter's with Shannon. <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is wonderful. Um, I do, ha I work with refugees and uh, refugees in Turkey as well. I'm just really curious about these uh, young, young boys who are obviously from Syria, are stranded uh, in Istanbul, and how you encountered them. And once they were arrested in the film, do you have any idea what happened to them? Yeah, so after 48 hours legally, the police have to let them go. And according to the boys that they were arrested pretty frequently, whenever people would call to complain, they would get picked up would have to stay for two nights in the jail and then they were released again. Um, and I met them through Zayton, the dog. So Zayton, I had begun filming with her and then she led me to these young men who had this relationship with her and Nazar. And so they were very much an organic part of her story. And I also feel like with the refugee crisis in, in Turkey and how many 
people are on the streets um, and, and seeking refuge in this country that has opened their doors and borders to them. Um, it was inevitable that a film about stray dogs was going to encounter people who were also sharing the streets with them. And, and I would love to maybe keep in touch later on about which particular refugee organizations in Turkey or Istanbul might be good to support. Because I had collaborated with Ahmet on, on trying to do some fundraising for the Animal Rights Federation that he is the chairman of. And I would also love to use some of the proceeds of Stray to, to try to help refugee, reputable refugee organizations. So maybe we can connect through Hope later on. That would be great. That's great. Thank you. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Um, let's see. Um, Catherine is having a, a question about um, the target audience of the film and you know the message and the intent of the film. Catherine? Uh, thanks. Thanks for joining us today, Elizabeth. I uh, appreciate you being here. Mine sort of tags off because you just you to this, but the title Stray refers to me just as much to the dogs as to the boys um, in this film because they have similar sort of situations. Um, so when your, your thought process is you were filming, were you thinking who is your target audience for your message here? Because you are, you know, you mentioned at the beginning and talking about the distrays and how different countries um, view the stray animals within their cities or in distant culturally. But um, did you ever think about like having more information about the refugee situation or, you know, the, the human and the dog strays or what was your thought process as you were filming? Yeah, um, for me, I think it's difficult to draw exact parallels between the human refugees and the stray dogs because I think dogs claiming the streets as their home is a very natural thing that they were evolved to do. And I don't think it's suffering for them but obviously humans being relegated to the streets um, and without housing is, is a much different experience. So I don't, would never draw that sort of one-to-one -one comparison. Um, but for me, I knew that in making a film about stray dogs, because they're not allowed in private spaces, the types of populations that stray dogs encounter are going to necessarily be people who either are relegated to the streets like the young men or are have to take to the streets, like the women who are in the women march who that Zaytan kind of happens upon, or are musicians busking on the side of the street trying to make a living. So I always knew that a stray dog was going to be, in a way, life as seen through the gaze of a stray dog will always be focusing on those who are surviving and some maybe sometimes thriving in the cracks of our society. Um, and that's because I come from the view that the world is always, the view of the world or society is always more accurate from the peripheries than from the centers of power. And so that was the intent behind that. Um, but I also think there has been this suggestion that maybe the film is a commentary about how dogs are treated better than humans in, in this particular society. But I really reject that idea because that whole idea is predicated on a belief that humans should be treated better than animals. And so the reverse of that is is crazy. And also from what I observed when I was there, I think the fact that Turkey has the largest refugee population, regardless of the political motivations to why the doors are open um, compared to Western Europe. It's also, it's no surprise to me that this society that has become a physical refuge, even if there's not enough infrastructure or resources for refugees, is the same society that has also chosen to embrace stray stray animals and tolerate stray animals. So I think there's, to me, there's some line there, although I'm not sure what mm -hmm. it is. Thank you for that. I think that your last statement there um, accurately reflects, you know, the, the viewpoint here. So I, I appreciate that commentary. Thank you. Um, Nazla is one of the members of our group. And we also, you know, it's kind of a little insular group. We have two book, two book clubs that um, a lot of us belong to as well. Um, and Nazla always um, imparts the, the wisdom she knows from being Turkish to, to us Yabanjis. So she has some, some interesting questions to ask you. And she's coming from her work computer. This is not allowing her to show video. So she's the little black screen there. Nazla? 
Um, hello, I apologize um, that you're not able to see me. I'm connecting from a work computer and I think when I was launching Zoom, uh, I did something wrong and it's not, um, it's not showing, um, the video is not working properly. Um, so my question is this, um, I was, um, I had, uh, I was somewhat, um, shall I say, saddened by both the dogs and the boys interaction with the people around them in that, um, uh, well, to me, it was, um, they were in a difficult situation and it seemed like nobody was really trying to help them um, in the sense that, okay, so they, the people around them were, um, uh, were permitting them to exist, but not necessarily um, uh, help them improve their lives. And this is true both for the, for the dogs and for the boys. So I was wondering, what's your opinion on um, uh, people's uh, attitudes towards the boys and the dogs? I mean, are they are people not helping because they don't know how to help, or are they not helping because they think it's a it's a reasonable state uh, to be in, or are they not helping because they're not interested that much? Uh, what's your opinion on that? I feel like I can't speak to the humanitarian crisis that is unfolding in Turkey and what the sentiments are there. But I feel like at least in terms of the dogs and Zaytan's life, she wouldn't be alive if people were not providing food to the stray animals. I, the stray dogs feed off of trash, but they also feed off of kibble that is left on the streets for all the stray cats and dogs by volunteers or the city. And I'm sure Amit will go into more detail about how that actually works. Um, Zaytan was never hungry for food. When I would try to you know, bribe her with food, um, she never responded that much because she was able to find such a rich diet on her own throughout the city. And so for me, I my sense of uh, Istanbul was that stray dogs were very much communally cared for. Um, even sometimes when I would try putting GPS tracking collars on the dogs so that I could keep track of them every night after I finished shooting with them, people would come up to me very alarmed and very protective of the dog saying, what are you doing? These dogs belong here. You can't take them. They have a right to be here. So for me, I was shocked in a good way that people were looking out for even these seemingly anonymous dogs. Um, and in terms of the refugees, for me, the scenes that unfold in the film, and many people have also commented this to me, they sense love there. They sense a lot of warmth that they don't think would exist if these scenes were taking place in America or England or France. The way that those security guards are, you know, kicking the boys out of evicting them out of these abandoned ruins, you know, they're still patting them on the back. They're still trying to give them this somewhat fatherly advice to, you know, stop sniffing glue. And even those, the passersbys who are misguided in telling those young men, hey, you should go back to Syria to try to get an education, sort of that kind of advice that rings hollow. They're still engaging with them in, in, in a way that I find unfamiliar in the cultures that I'm from, the way that outsiders are treated. And often I did ask Turks, what, you know, what, what, how do you feel about the refugee crisis? How do you feel about these people who are not directly from your own culture coming into your country? And at least in the ones that I spoke with, they told me that for them, it, they saw them as their brethren who were in need. And so, their country was there. Of course, these sentiments are not blanket statements, but this is just anecdotally from what I observed. But I, I definitely can't speak um, as as much as I feel at liberty to about the stray dogs, as I can as I yeah as I can about stray dogs, but not about refugees. As as my area of interest when I ventured into this film was the stray dogs, and and Ahmet probably can fill you a lot more into the Turkish sort of ideas around stray dogs and, and maybe even the sentiment now towards 
the political sentiment towards refugees because I'm sure it's probably changed over the years since I was filming. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, speaking of the boys, did, did they have parents or family there? Yeah, some of them did have family and some of them were living, their families were living on the outskirts of Istanbul where they were assigned to have work permits there, but the boys wanted to go into the center of the city where they were not able to find work because their permits were uh, not zoned okay. for that area, but they wanted to go to the city center because they would be able to beg for more money. Okay. So some of them had had family members in, in small apartments, just, but just cho they chose to be out there on the street because it was easier for them to beg that way. I, I know one question that everybody had, what did they ever find uh, cartel? Whatever happened to cartel? Unfortunately, no. That is one of the big regrets I have during production that we didn't intervene when the young men stole Kartal from the construction site away from his family. We did wonder, should we return Kartal back to the family or even adopt Kartal into my producer's home? But at the time we felt it would be a big betrayal to the young men who obviously wanted to acquire this puppy to care for something despite how harsh their own circumstances were. And we didn't know what the emotional impact would be on the boys and also whether cartel could blossom under these young men in the way that Zaytan and Nazar seemed to be independent adult dogs that were fully functioning in Turkish society. But before we could make any decision, the police took him and we never were able to find out where they took cartel to. I know in the Q&A session that I attended, you, you were hoping maybe that one of the policemen adopted the dog, but- they That's what we hope, because we searched all the shelters and, and Cartel never showed up in those shelters. So yeah, I don't know, but we'll never know, unfortunately. Um, Ruth Terry, who was the founder of, of the group that we were in today, um, had some questions about um, the, the people who were the, extras in the film and you know the the filming of their private conversations and the release of their conversations Ruth? yeah yeah so basically the filming style was i would be following zaytan with a camera and then my producer who's turkish would be recording with a bi-directional microphone all the conversations and sounds that were happening around zaytan and nazar and kartal and whenever Zaytan would wander up to a couple arguing about whatever, um, we would just keep filming. And sometimes we would step in and say, hey, do you mind if we film you? We're making a film about what a stray dog sees and hears. And most people, once they hear that as the log line, their guards come down and they are fine with us filming. Also, I think because I was a foreigner and didn't understand Turkish, that maybe put people at ease also. And I was always amazed by the transcripts when I got them back translated, <laughs> what people were willing to reveal in front of the camera. And then after we recorded their conversation, we would run and get their releases. So that was how that worked. R Ruth, do you want to elaborate? You, I think you had more parts of the, any other- Oh yeah, I just wondered like, um like in terms of filming on like Istakal and like filming policemen and like, and in addition the private conversations and stuff like what kind of like legal restrictions were there or logistics challenges? Um, yeah, we had blanket permits for the city mm -hmm. filming in the city and we, we got those. And so I think legally it was fine and I think that scene with the policeman in particular is in two, mm -hmm. that was filmed in 2019 and the mm -hmm. vibe that the sentiment in the air felt a lot less tense than it was in 2017 mm -hmm. and so I think that also contributed to how at ease the police were and be, from being filmed but it's because they could tell I was focused on Zaytan and so mm -hmm. I think for pe most people it seemed more like an oddity than anything really threatening. Interesting thank you. Yeah. That's great. Um, that's the questions we have from our group. Is there anybody else that has questions directed at Elizabeth? I think we have time for one or two. Anybody else? Um, if not, then um, we can shift to uh, questions for Ahmed and Elizabeth, if you want to stay a few more minutes or if you need to go, we understand. 
And we really, really thank you so much for your time and we'll continue to promote it for you. <laughs> thank you. I have to run to another appointment and uh, I hope you guys learn a lot from Ahmet um, and donate to yes, HITAP. It's one of the most meaningful things that I, I feel like I've, I've been able to do by yeah. collaborating with Ahmet and HITAP and the work, the incredible groundbreaking work that they do in Turkey that you know other animal rights activists from around the world are I feel like are looking now to high tap as a model to aspire to in making animal rights go mainstream in Turkey. Thank you. But thank you so much for supporting the film and enjoy the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much thank for you. Being here, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to the point about people, other countries looking to Amit for um, guidance to help their country. Um, we have Anastasia here from Moldova, um, who was, uh, has, has a whole list of questions that Amit already has. Um, Trudy had a lot of questions as well, and Rachel had some questions, and um, I've already submitted them to Amit. And Amit, perhaps you can just start um, and explain um, a little bit about your organization and maybe uh, what your specific uh, current goals are and maybe touch to the, some of the questions and then we can get more into a question and answer format. You're muted. Okay. I, have, I hope I can uh, finish it in, in 20, 25 minutes for all, for all the questions. <laughs> I will just say one thing, sorry to interrupt, is that I'm willing to stay as long as you're willing to stay and people, if they want to stay as well. Um, but, you know, th that's totally up to you. I think Zoom has a limited time. Uh, I think in one hour, it, it stops automatically. I, Anyways, I for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, um, uh, my name is Ahmed. I live in Istanbul. I'm an attorney at law. Uh, I work for HITAP as a volunteer, uh, and I'm a, I'm the president of HITAP since 2008, which means which which we started HITAP. Uh, HITAP is a federation. In Turkish law, it means that it's consisting of uh, associations. Federation means uh, the consisting of other associations. So we are a kind of umbrella covering the other local. Uh, local small associations all over the country. So we are not working in in just in Istanbul or in some part of Istanbul, but uh, we have a duty that uh, that we try to do some public awareness all over the country. So uh, my my first aim was to go into this uh, this volunteer work is to change the law. As you're already aware, uh, just like in many countries, the sanctions of our legislations are quite weak. So, and that's why uh, I wanted to make a kind of uh, alteration in our in our leg uh, animal laws legislation. But since I am not a deputy working in the parliament, I have no power. I'm not a minister. I have no power. So what what I can do is that to set up an NGO, which, which is going to make a pressure on the parliament. So in the beginning of 2000, uh, I had the same ideas just like today, like 17, 20 years ago, uh, but I had no power to do something. Today still, I don't have power either, but at least I have an NGO in my hands. So when, when a television or a, when a journalist or just like people you are uh, want to, wanted to make a kind of review or our opinions regarding with the law, uh, I have a microphone in my hands, more than a microphone, maybe an amphi, an amphi, which I use our NGO to, to reflect our voices to the millions. If I had been a lonely animal lover, it would have been only in my Twitter address, possibly, or in my lonely website. Only my close friends will hear the good news or my ideas. So it wouldn't have an effect. Uh, NGO idea is maybe for Westerners, it's, it's, not an, uh, it's not a strange thing, but for Turkey, an NGO is still not accepted as an idea. 
the Turkey Turkish brains or mentality is not very close to the NGO mentality because we are coming from an uh, Ottoman era time and we have always uh, admired the one person minded ideas. Uh, so even if you speak uh, with parliamentarians or municipalities, uh, they do not want to speak with the NGOs because in Turkey, most of the time, they think that their brain is much better than any NGO or any other brain. So they somehow symbolically, they, they, they call you, but when you're a mayor, you are like a king. That means you don't have to listen to their ideas. So first of all, we have to change this mentality. We have to make our country uh, uh, full of NGOs. Of course we have NGOs, but they are mostly based on the people's uh, people's local identity. For instance, a person from Trabzon comes to Istanbul and set, set, up, uh, set up an association and calls it as Trabzon Lovers Association. A person comes from Erzurum to Ankara and set up an NGO, calls it as Erzurum Lovers uh, uh, Stating Out in, in, in Ankara. So it's more, the NGOs are accepted as just like people's uh, based territory. It's not a real NGO. NGO means, as you know, uh, it has to have a um, civil power over the uh, newspapers, over media, over parliament, over municipalities, for anything. So if you have a power in your background, then you are accepted by the uh, by the politicians, at least by the politicians. Why? Because you have a potential vote for them. If you are lonely, they don't care about you. That's why in our country, unfortunately, the sheikhs, the mullahs, the religion people are, since they have millions of millions, thousands of people in, the, in their hands, they are accepted more than environmentalists, than animal rights groups, than uh, lawyers, or than other, other people. So, what my idea was to set up an NGO. So HITAP is, is an NGO, let's say, a federation. That's why we, we uh, put this, uh, we set up HITAP. And for the last 20 years, we are always on the televisions. We were accepted by even President Erdogan, who has an absolute power all over the country, which was impossible before that. And uh, the, 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 uh, also the artists, the famous people, uh, they accept that also the companies, uh, they want to uh, direct their donations to have one NGO, one powerful NGO. Just like Elizabeth mentioned a couple of minutes ago, she also donated uh, <coughs> her uh, revenues from the straight movie to HITAP. So uh, what we try to do is to make the NGO, to make it bigger. Why? In order to change the lives, the welfare of the animals in country. Otherwise, you are alone. So what we try to do is to make this uh, brand uh, not a PETA, I'm not a dreamist, but at least in, inside the whole country, a, a, reputable, uh, a reputable association. In that case, they will hear our voices regarding zoos, regarding circuses, regarding legislation, regarding pet shops, regarding stray animals, regarding of anything that you are going to ask. So everything starts from setting up a reputable NGO, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't create the effect when you set, set up the idea. You have, to, you have to work for many years. As I told you, HITAP is uh, 12, 13 years old, which is still young. If, if we had the uh, NGO like, uh, if it had been, born like in 1980s, 1970s, I would have transferred, I would have get, uh, <clears throat> got an NGO with a reputable name and with a, a 40, 50 years background. My, my job would be easier. However, <laughs> however, if I manage, I will transfer this NGO with, with donations, with uh, companies, with all its name and people to the, to the youngers in the next future. So everything starts, not with loving animal, but everything starts with uh, having a nice microphone, big microphone. The more you have a big microphone, 
the more your, your voice goes all around, the more you cover most of the people. So let's go. This, is, this was the in, in, uh, introduction, <laughs> long in, in instruction. Um, so uh, what we have in Turkey is, as you may have uh, guessed from the Stray movie, and since you have been living in Turkey, I assume, you, you also observe that uh, we are a kind of country in many ways, uh, not a Middle Eastern country, but neither a Western country. So we are a bridge between two cultures, between two cultures. You see it everywhere, every day in your life, when in your daily life. For instance, you can see a skyscraper and a single dwelling next to each other. You can see a very rich person, a Mercedes, a BMW, a secular person somewhere, and a and a person with 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 black veil. Anyways, we are struggling all the way. Why not the stray animals? They are also in this bridge. They are also among this um, cradle of civilizations, let's say, for the last 300 years. For the last 300 years. It's not, it's not the last 20, 30 years problem. Uh, why for the last 300 years? Because as you know, Ottoman era, Ottoman empire had a big impact in Europe until 18th century. But after 18th century, 17th century, the country had become too smaller. So the sultans and the people working in the palace thought that uh, how can we become just like in our old days? How can we catch that gold times? So they thought that if we become Westerner, then we can be also uh, an European country. So we will not diminish, we will not get smaller, but we will be bigger, just like in old days. So they thought that they will change everything just like, uh, just like Europeans did, because in the wars, they were always losing the wars in the 17th and 18th century. So <clears throat> for instance, our, one of our sultans called Mahmoud II, uh, which he is called as a uh, foreigner sultan uh, by, by by our uh, conservative people, he said that okay, we will change our costumes, we will change our hats, we will, uh, we, you will put my pictures on the walls, you will do everything. What necessary is done, but what he said was th the change in the country must have been in symbolically, not in reality, but in symbolically. He tried to change also the army. However, it didn't help. As Elizabeth, Elizabeth mentioned half an hour ago, one of the English diplomats who, who visited uh, Istanbul in the beginning of uh, 1820s was bitten by a stray animal in Galata Bridge in Istanbul, in the center of, in the, center of the capital. So um, the English government has just uh, written, uh, has just given a, a nota to the, to the uh, Protested the, protested the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Sultan. How could it be possible that an English diplomat could be bitten by a stray animal? A stray animal cannot, couldn't uh, survive, couldn't live in the center of a capital. So the Mount the Second said that all the stray animals must be uh, taken away from the from the capital and must be sent sent to the. Uh, isolated island, which is in the middle of, middle of the Marmara, Marmara Sea. Today, we call that island as, as Hayrsız Ada, uh, no man's land, let's say. So uh, that's, that procedure had been uh, reviewed three times in our history. One of them was in 1820. Uh, the other one was in 1850s. And the last, the last and the most uh, dangerous and most uh, effective one, let's say, it was in 1910. So uh, the first one and the second one uh, was somehow by, somehow um, was rejected by the public. The conservative, conservative people of the Ottoman uh, Empire just asked from the Sultan that these animals must be taken back to the city again. Otherwise, since these animals are innocent, they have no guilt, uh, we will be punished as a public. However, the big uh, Istanbul fire, the big Istanbul earthquake had happened just after this uh, deportation of the animals. So people were already conservative and they thought that 
this happened because we had we had to send all those animals to this isolated island. And these two uh, these two voyages had somehow come back. But the one in 1910, the, the one in 1910, which were uh, almost 80,000 stray animals, not 8,000, 80,000, 80, 80,000 stray animals were collected from the city center, from Istanbul, and sent back to that isolated island to Hayr Sızada. And they start to death because in that island, there were no water, no trees, nothing else. Even today, if you go, this is a very small island, which is back of uh, uh, Büyükada, Heybeliada. There is no single dwelling. No one lives there, no water, nothing. Even today, it's very small. So these 80,000 animals had to die because in the, in the beginning of 1910s, uh, Turkey had already corrupted. We were just on the edge of the First World War. And at the okay. beginning, people were sending uh, water and food in the first weeks, but later on, they forgot. So the, these animals died there. So okay. why, did, why did this idea come out? Because everybody thought that if we uh, put these animals down or, or if we kill them, or if we get away from them, we will be a Westerner because in Western countries, even in the 17th and 18th century, you don't see any animal on the street. The same mentality still goes on today. Some of our people who see Berlin, London, New York, LA, Canada, whatever, since they don't see any stray animals on the streets, they say that we shouldn't have any stray animals on the streets. We shouldn't have a tolerance limit for these animals if you want to be part of Westerner country. So as I told you in the beginning, the cradle of civilizations are still fighting with each other in every way. The stray animals also take their part. However, our legislation, when you look at our legislation, animal rights law legislation today, you see this dilemma still in this legislation because in article six, it says that uh, to putting, putting them down of all kinds of stray animals are forbidden. You cannot kill any animal. You cannot kill them. You have, you have to take them from the street if they are not vaccinated. Uh, you have to vaccinate them and you have to take them and you have to leave these animals to the place where you have taken them to the same place. So it's, it's very clear. However, when you come to the sanctions of the same article, if you don't do that, if you kill any of those stray animals, what happens when you look at the sanctions, it's nothing, just a symbolic, symbolic penalty, money penalty, let's say. So in this legislation, you, you can still see that dilemma in somehow, in somehow, you let those stray animals to live in our surroundings with their faith. However, when you come to the sanctions, you don't say anything. You are a little bit weak. So, uh, our, uh, of course, Turkey is an exceptional country. We don't want hundreds of dogs, thousands of dogs going all around the streets and barking and biting. You know, we don't want this, but the solution is trap, neuter, and release system, which we try to force the public administ administrations to do that. You will trap the animals innocently, neuter them, and release to the area where you have taken them. Of course, you don't see these in Western countries. When you see a pity animal on the streets, authorities come, take and probably put him down. I think in America, it's like 48 hours. You have, even if it's an owned uh, animal, if you leave it, the sheriff comes and puts him down. Here in Turkey, everybody is against this. Even the ones who do not want to see an, any animal on the street, they don't, they don't want them to be killed. They don't want them to be, to be put them down, but they think that the shelters must be a solution. But 
they have no idea how the shelters positions are. They're horrible. Most of them are horrible. And in the shelters, you cannot keep healthy animals there. If an animal is healthy, if he can survive, he doesn't have to be uh, in, in a jail. That's what we think. Just in Istanbul, we estimate that 100,000 of dogs are, are living right now, which is quite a lot. Maybe you don't see them in Taksim, in Kadiköy, in Beşiktaş, in downtown. But when you go to the outskirts of the city, like Şile, Sarıyer, Zekeriyaköy, Slivri, the villages all around the city, you see them. Because, OK, municipalities do not kill them, but they take them, they dump them to the outskirts of the city, to the other city's limits, borders. However, you don't you don't solve the, you don't solve the problem. You just you know uh, push it away for a while. Just twenty years ago, thirty years ago, I don't know if you were in Istanbul in nineteen eighties. Uh, the mayor of Istanbul Greater Municipality uh, was saying that we will take all those stray animals from the streets of Istanbul and we will send them to the China. We, will, we, will, we would have earned money as well because they were eating dogs there. The mentality was like that. Whose mentality? The mayor of Istanbul's mentality was like that in the 1980s. And many people did that. In 1950s, in Istanbul, 140,000 cats and dogs were euthanized or were, were killed. When we come to 1980s, even the mayor was stating out this clearly. I don't know if you know the Baghdad Street, which is the fifth avenue of Istanbul, which is the most luxurious posh part of the city. In the beginning of 1980s, uh, the, um, not the police officers, but the Zabata, uh, uh, who is the uh, guardians of the municipality, let's say, were killing these stray animals by rifles in front of people. Not in the village, not in the outskirts of the city, not in the central Turkey, but in Baghdad Street. It's on the newspapers, I still remember. But from that mentality, we came to this, this way. It took a long way, it took a long time to change the legislation, to change the mentality. Today, in, uh, in the statements of the mayors, you most of the time you see that on their billboards that please water them, please feed them, please have a cup of water in front of your uh, houses. It changed in 30 years. But you have to work a lot with PR, with your workings, with your NGO, whatever. So it's not easy. OK, we want to be part of Western country, but not like that, not by putting them down. Even some people still today uh, say it's so. We are totally against it. The only solution is trapping, neutering, and releasing. By the time the, the population will decrease automatically. However, however, if you close your eyes to the pet shops, to the puppy mills, to importing of the dogs from, especially from Eastern, uh, Eastern European countries like Moldova, Bulgaria, Russia, Romania, if they come it easily and if they are sold out, even in the internet, even in the pet shops, that means that there is a big waterfall which is coming from the ceiling, but we all try to clean the floor. So it doesn't help to the solution. You cannot decrease the population by even neutering. So we try to convince the municipalities and the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Agriculture, which is responsible for the animals, to encourage, uh, to encourage Neut uh, neutralizing and to stop these pet shops. However, even the pet shops have their NGOs, have their powerful NGOs because they earn money, they earn profit from that. That's why uh, 
for for the uh, for the uh, new amendment we cannot put we cannot uh, say that state out that uh, please stop all those pet shops which are selling puppies or animals live animals so they are powerful as well so the more we are powerful the more we will have an effect impact on the parliament on the uh, ministry so that's why ngo is important they have their ngos as well Hunters, they have their NGOs are very powerful because they have money. Dolphinariums, they have their NGOs, quite powerful because they have money. Uh, the zoos, the distributors, which are bringing all those animals from Africa, from Asia, they are earning money. They are taking commission from that. They are powerful as well. So in order to stop them, to, to beat them or to fight with them is not the solution. You have to have your powerful NGO against them. Because in 1980s, we didn't have those NGOs. Only we were, you know, just saying in, in, in a very weak voice that please don't kill those innocent animals in Baghdad street. But I was saying by myself, today, maybe they are afraid of because of social media, because of NGOs, because of our works. They cannot, you know, do that easily. They have to do it, you know, in, in hidden, in hidden uh, doors, let's say. So the more you are powerful, the more they are back up. So we are fighting with all those, uh, all those animal rights, uh, animal rights, uh, uh, how can I say, anti-animal rights movements. The, 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 mm, mm, for instance, uh, if you are in Istanbul, we had those horse carriages in, in islands, in Princess Islands. And Ekrem Imamoglu was uh, elected. Why did he stop all those horse carriages? Does he, does he like horses so much? I don't think so. We started the campaign of uh, horse carriages uh, beginning from 2010. I remember that I was the only one who was saying by myself that it, you know, went all over the country. At the end, Izmir, Adana, Antalya, Kuşadası, Didim, Istanbul had just taken them out. They didn't do it by themselves. If we were not ha have that power, those horses would have suffered, continue to suffer again, even today. Um, this is a kind of a summary about the stray animals. When you are saying strays, you usually think about the uh, cats and talk, dogs. However, we have donkeys, horses, all those uh, dolphinariums, circuses, zoos, we, we also accept them as 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 strays as well. Um, maybe it is it is difficult to understand for a Westerner to have all those strays all over the streets. We don't want them either. We don't want them either on the streets. However, putting them down easily, just like Western countries did, is not accepted by our culture. Of course, when you when you see the uh, Turkish culture. Many people do not want those stray animals in their homes, maybe cats, but the dogs are not that. They keep the dogs in, in front of their dogs, maybe in their gardens as a guardians. Cats is okay, it's more acceptable. However, even if they do not want to own those dogs, they don't want them to be killed. Most of the time they, they call the municipality and they want that dog to be taken away from their neighborhood. But they don't, they don't follow what happens at the end. Most of the time they are in the outskirts of the city. I have a question about that. Like, for example, there's a pack of street dogs, um, you know, actually closer to Shannon's house than mine. And I'm very much a dog lover. I rescued a dog from Belgrade Forest last year, exactly one year ago. But now they're beginning to terrorize us on our street and like they're pooping on my lawn and I actually saw worms there. I mean, 
what, what do we do? What, what do we personally do? I don't want anything to happen to them, but you know, we're afraid to go out at night to, you know, to, to walk. You're right. That, that, that's one of, the, that's one of the main, uh, main problems of the, of, of the <laughs> city. Uh, the only way is to neuter them. If you neuter them, they, they socialize easily. If you do not neuter them, if you do not neuter them, uh, they cannot be socialized easily. The neutering is the best way. Maybe you will do it by your own fundings, or if they are much too much, you will force your municipality to do that. Neutering is the, is the best way. Then they become socialized. And sometimes, you know what? These animals are clever. The socialized animal, which have been living in your neighborhood, in your ghetto, knows who is who. He knows where to go. He knows where to hide. He knows where to find food. He knows where to go, which garbage he has to go. He knows to stop at the red light. <laughs> however, however, a dog comes from an, another ghetto, probably dumped from an, another uh, mayor's municipality, comes to your area and disturbs the ones, the socialized ones, the innocent ones. Mm -hmm. And a neighbor in your uh, in your in your ghetto calls the municipality, and when when the municipality comes, takes away that socialized animal. Mm. It stops at the red light, which knows the area. Mm. The no naughty ones already escapes. Mm. So the innocent one is, you know, punished, mm. and all of a sudden he wakes up in the outskirts of the city, and he cannot survive. Probably is under a car in a traffic accident or he cannot live in that ghetto, in that forest. The naughty one already escapes and they cannot get that. So the uh, best way is that all the municipalities, we have 39 municipalities all around uh, the Istanbul and the greater one, totally 40 municipalities, let's say, this neutering system must be done all over the city, not in, only in one ghetto. If you do it in Taksim, but if you don't do it in Sarıyer, it doesn't work. Yes, um, a couple of people have um, written and said they've had questions. Um, one of them is Meg. And then the next one would be Nazla. Meg, unmute, unmute. Okay, I was just, um writing a second question in the chat. But my first question was this. Um, I'm, I, I would like you to tell me how an NGO, like those that you've described, becomes powerful. Okay, so I understand it probably takes money, but I don't understand what you can do with that money to make yourself more politically influential. Um, certainly you can raise awareness, you can buy advertising, you can start programs where you're neutering animals, but how do you influence politicians so that you can gain leverage over the NGOs, for example, that represent the puppy mills? Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, Erdogan is, yeah. is the absolute power all over the country for the last 20 years. He is like a king, you know, <laughs> it's, it's undiscussable. So even he accepted us in his table talking about also, animal, talking about the animal rights before okay. i'm not a pro erdogan i'm not a, i'm against him to be honest but he accepted this is the this this happens first time all over the turkish history it's, it happens first time it never happened before it never happened before if we didn't have that even that small power he wouldn't have accept us. Of course, we want to his table, his office, with the celebrate celebrities next to us. Why did uh, those okay. celebrities come with us? Because we had a, at least a reputable name. They thought that if if they come with us, it would have an effect. After sure. 2010, after 2010, this talking about the amendments of the law has begun to spoken all over the parliament, on the televisions, in the newspapers. Before that, the ministry was always re rejecting our demands. He was not accepting 
to change the law. Yeah. Of course, today nothing has nothing has changed since 2010. But at least, at least, even many animal uh, associations, animal lover associations, even animal lovers, are talking about it, and the municipalities had had has stopped poisoning animals, even though Erdogan didn't say that, please do not stop, uh, please do not um, uh, poison those animals. Even, even he didn't say. Moreover, two years ago or last year, he and his wife adopted a stray animal from a shelter. So how did it happen? It comes slowly. I can observe this. If I was born yesterday, I would never understand. It's a normal thing. Okay, he went there, he adopted a dog. It's normal for us, but for a conservative and fundamentalist person, which has lots of boundaries with, you know, Westerner fashion, has adopts a dog from a shelter, not a, from a pet shop. Okay. You know. It, it, it comes forward. so it sounds like it sounds like you're saying that you need to make a lot of noise and get influential people on your side and the more influential people you have on your side the more these ideas begin to change of course and that, so that's what you that's what you're trying to achieve with whatever funds and whatever resources you have that, um, that, I was, so, so that's my question is like what was your strategy and you just answered that i have one other question um this is based on personal experience. What I have seen in many, many cases around me is these young guys who want these designer dogs, you know, the badass dogs they want, Dobermans, they want Rottweilers, they want pit bulls, and they take the females and they breed them once and then they dump them. And I'm, I, I don't understand that mentality. Can you explain that to me? Um, if I cannot explain that. I, just, I don't because, understand why these females have a shelf life. Uh, because, you know, these, these people are uh, less educated people. And when they have those brand, uh, brand name animals like, like Rottweilers, Pitbulls, Doga Argentinos, when they have next to them, they feel that they are like a Zeus. You know, they, they feel like a god. Because in their normal social life, they are not accepted. However, no, even if it, even it is uh, not uh, uh, even if it is in the in our legislation, the, it's forbidden to have to own a pit bull to su to sell a pit bull. But when you go into the internet today, if you want to buy a pit bull, they send you by cargo. Which means the sanctions of the legislation. We have legislation, but the sanctions are weak. So our aim is. To change the sanctions, the, the articles are nice. We have no problem with the articles. But the, since the sanctions have no power over the people, you can buy, breed, and you are not punished. So somehow you are encouraging people to do that. So our main aim is to change it. And we don't accept these people as animal lovers. They are just like, they are showmen, you know. And because of them, we, our reputation is also affected by their negative negative attitudes. Our aim is not, uh, you know, to own all those pit bulls to Rottweilers. Our aim is to work for stray animals, strays, which means they have no uh, possession. I understand. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Meg. Um, Nasla. Hi, Mr. Shampolat. Um, so I have, uh, I also have two questions that are related to previous questions uh, asked by Hope and Meg. Um, so one of my questions is um, like a follow-up question to Hope's question, in the sense that I also we also have a pack uh, of dogs in my neighborhood. We we had an older pack who gets along with all the other stray animals in our district, and now we have a new pack of uh, younger dogs who keep killing stray cats. And uh, there are uh, opposing views in my neighborhood. By the way, I'm an assistant muhtar, muhtar azası, as we call it. 
in uh, in Beyoğlu, um, one pack, like one group of our, um, uh, as you said, like Turkish people are always, they have like conflicting views about animals and like whether or not we should interfere, interfere with animals. And one group of our neighbors, they think it's in the dog's nature to chase cats, uh, so on and so forth. So we couldn't be touching those dogs. And then another group of neighbors who feed the stray cats and they're absolutely, um, uh, you know, at odds with this question. And when I call um, Beyoğlu municipality, they say, well, we don't really, we can't really do anything unless they bite people. So we can't really um, pick up any dogs because they're attacking stray animals. Like we could do something if they were attacking humans, which has happened, but the humans haven't followed up because they like animals too. But we can't, so we can't prevent a stray animal from hurting a stray animal. So I would like to get your opinion on that. If there's any legal way uh, we can, uh, we, we, we can even, we, we even found, um, uh, a, uh, a a private shelter, and we're prepared to pay for the private shelter to host these dogs, but uh, the municipality doesn't want to catch them. Our neighbors don't want uh, us to place them in the private shelter, and we we don't know what we can do. And my second question is this: uh, I've uh, seen lots of groups on Facebook that openly uh, uh, they provide a platform for uh for selling of animals and they have things like they don't say tl because facebook will will pick up the fact that uh, an animal is is being sold and will close down the group so they they have like passwords like they say puan instead of tl to hide the fact that this animal is being is being sold and i have like screenshots for these kind types of groups and i complained to facebook a couple of times but they haven't shut these groups down so what can we do as people, like as user of these platforms uh, to kind of shut them down and then, uh, you know, to try and have like these, these breeders um, who even post the, uh, pictures of these animals and the animals look in very poor shape. What can we do as people to shut down these groups? Uh, regarding with your first question, uh, it's dogs natural habitat. You can't do anything. Uh, they will they will <laughs> follow the cats. The cats follow the mice. Uh, so you cannot prevent the dogs that to stop doing that. It's his natural habitat. Uh, the problem is that how many dogs you have in your uh, ha uh, in your neighborhood? Because every neighborhood has a tolerance limit. If, for instance, your neighborhood can have, let's say, maximum 10 dogs, maximum 10 straights, maybe 15, I don't know. But it cannot be 60 or 70. If the tolerance limit is uh, more than acceptable, then the problem comes out because people somehow complain. It's their right. But 10 or 15 can be tolerable. And 10 and 15 dogs can chase, let's say, the cats. And the cats probably escape, and they will follow the mice. And mice. Well, will in this away. case, we found we found like thirty de dead cats uh, within this year. It will and happen. Some, you, yeah. you, you can you can you cannot stop it. It's it's their it's their natural habitat. You know you can if if a stray animal stays on the on the uh, street, he has to behave like that. He cannot you know behave like a pet animal who lives in the house, he has to, in order to survive, you know, he has to be a little bit, you know, aggressive. He has to show his teeth. He has to bark. You cannot I mean, expect simple, him to do so, like, but probably. I've asked, uh, like, I've asked two trainers and the trainers said, told me, they said this type of behavior is a bit abnormal, even for the stray animals, because they say the stray animals, they usually adapt to their uh, surroundings. So if they live in a park, then they don't hunt the cats in the park. If they live in a district, they usually don't hunt the animals in their district. Uh, but it seems like, especially one of these dogs, he, and he is very like, he seems very tense too. 
um, he just goes about killing these stray animals. So for what I hear from you is like, it seems like uh, there is no legal, um, there's nothing legally that there's not a legal do. way because every dog must live in in its territory and i'm not a dog trainer actually i don't want to say something uh, which i don't know which i'm not expert at, actually uh, so but legal wise uh, okay so how about the second one the the facebook groups that sell facebook, animals well the facebook policy is different <laughs> even if you even if you say something against Atatürk, they don't they don't shut them down you know, uh, Facebook is not care about the animals. The only way is to change the law. If we change the law, if we say that the pet shops and the selling of the animals is prohibited by, by law, Facebook has to obey. So what and we I have to do like... is to give our power to change the legislation. Then the I other think, steps yeah. will come away. I, feel I don't like... know how Facebook works because it's, it's yeah. a social media and they are thinking about their earning their profit. They don't care about animal rights or, you know, selling yeah. pit bulls. They don't do anything feel, for most uh, of the things. I don't know if this is correct, but I had I had read somewhere that the only uh, breeds that are permittable to be bred in Turkey legally by legal breeders are dogs like German Shepherds, Kangals, um, and no, like- No, no, every, every, dog, every dog is breeded. Nothing is prohibited. Really? Okay. Not, nothing is prohibited. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately. So what, how do you make okay, sure okay, that? Thank, thank sorry, you. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Let, let, let's let's move on. Um, okay. Anastasia has has joined us from Moldova. Um, do you have like one or two questions that um, you'd like answered uh, before we? Yeah, we sign actually, off? I cannot. It's about uh, this pro uh, the program capturing uh, neutering. Uh, vaccinating and letting go. Uh, I'd like to ask how did you kind of convince people to accept it? Because uh, in Moldova, the situation is really similar to Turkey, just some step behind because our society is split in two. Like one says there shouldn't be any dogs, any stray dogs on the street. And that's just, that's all. And then we try to convince them and then, then people just start to complain. We try to explain them like, what's the problem with the dog? Did the dog attack you? What did the dog do? So what, are you waiting the dog to attack me? That's a dog, it's uh, just, it can be dangerous. And they just um, kind of um, use it. They uh, use this fact and many politicians and officials use this fact just to ban the dogs, just to do different things in order to uh, to do just to destroy them somehow, let's say like this. And uh, how did you convince people not to want it? Just to understand that. Uh, as I told okay. you before, you have to you have to lobby in your parliament. You have okay. to do your lobbying by NGO mm -hmm. powers, not by yourself. Okay, you have okay. to be a powerful NGO, and then you will do advertisements, public awareness. If we okay. have time, I can I can uh, now share some some our short movies. Maybe I had, I had okay. send you some of them. So you will convince them by mm -hmm. by by showing that you are powerful. If you are lucky, maybe one or two persons uh, working in the parliament in the ministry mm -hmm. is an animal lover. But okay. most of the time, these bureaucrats, these politicians are very rude. They have you know they have no yeah. sense of you know, emotion, especially if they are men, if they are not women, you cannot, you cannot touch their hearts. They only uh, understand from thing. power. Uh, Politicians understand okay. from power. You have to speak with their own language. If you are powerful, they respect mm -hmm. you. Unfortunately, it's all over the world. It's like that. So everything starts out having a powerful microphone. That microphone okay. is your NGO. Okay. Even if they don't allow animals, but if you have a power, mm -hmm. they respect you. They obey you. That's why you can use our short movies if you want in your televisions, okay. in your local media, in your social media. It might, it might, it might give you some uh, some time as well. You don't have to spend most of the, most of your time to create those movies. And so, uh, mm -hmm. if you are not powerful, even if you say you know something from from the prophets, from the Bible, from Quran, they are not affected. They are politicians. Okay. Their, their language is, you know, 
their language is based on power all the time. So when you animal lovers, most of the time, all over the world, are weak. They are emotional. Mm -hmm. They yes. cannot think yes. with their brain. They, their heart works. But this is not this is not a connection with a politician. They don't understand this, this bridge. So you have to speak. Uh, with their own language, so, which is uh, ours. <laughs> uh, like you said, that you're just uh, or the high top. It's a whole federation. Did it help somehow? Did it did it make you powerful? The fact that all this little association, animal flowers, became a federation. Did it help? Of and course, all, of, of course. course. Okay. Because and I was saying the same things mm -hmm. in the beginning of two thousands, which there was no high top, which was there was no mm -hmm. federation. I am saying the same things today after twenty years. I haven't changed my my words. I haven't changed my sentences, but this time I'm using a microphone. So, uh, and another question, like I'm thinking now, what can be done about becoming powerful? Tell me, please, uh, did you collaborate with other uh, NGOs? For example, you know, all the NGOs, they fight for a reason and they are like connected with a solidarity. I mean, feminist, I mean, uh, echo uh, people who are for, um, for try to protect the environment. Would it be just a way just to all the NGOs to connect? I don't know. Would it, would it give us power, let's say, like of this? Of course, of course, because our aim is the same. Our aim is the same. The only way is to reach them in a, uh, in, in a language which, which they understand. If we have, if we have a, the same target, why don't we go together? If we are separated, you know, they will crush us easily in every way, in feminism, in environmentalism, in animal rights, in everything. So the politicians do not want to see organized groups in front of them. Organized groups are dangerous for them. But if you are already organized, then that means that you are strong, strong enough. Then they accept you in their table. At least they listen to you. They leave, they change their duties. However, you stay still there. You know, even the parliamentarians change, you are you have still your NGO and you are still have a reputation. And even the next parliamentarians which were which will be elected will call you again. Of course, this is not a one day solution. Even the PETA, which is the, the biggest organization on animal lovers, animal rights, uh, has not solved many problems, but it it creates a great impact all over the people. They, they have to change the mentality of the people. Okay. And there was no PETA, for instance, even I wouldn't uh, read many articles, I wouldn't learn something. Many generations will learn from each other and many generations learn how to organize. The Thank first you. the first step is to start not petting the animal, not owning an animal. These are uh, these are secondary secondary things. My my mind is is based on still for organizing and being getting together all the okay. time. So it's basically educating politicians, and then politicians will influence the population, not other way around. Uh, no. Okay. No, not the other way around. Thank the politicians, you. municipalities, mayors, governors, all the people who has a power in their hands. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to just end with, with two more questions from like a practical standpoint. One of them actually comes from Rachel. And sorry, I'm going to, to just uh, ask the question. Um, what, what can we do in our neighborhood to um, trap, neuter, release, how do, what do we, you know, especially as um, non-Turkish speakers, how do we go about, who do we contact and what, what, what do we do? Uh, <laughs> I don't know actually for the foreigners what you can do. Uh, even I see some, some foreigners uh, living in Antalya, Fethiye, Alanya, if what I see is that it's mostly the same same thing. They are always disorganized. They live in the same city, but they are sometimes or most of the time they fight with each other. They don't accept the other association. Uh, they have no aim to become together. You know, even they are Turkish or foreigners. They give the same same symptoms. <laughs> I'm afraid. The, the, the starting is getting, as I told you, it's not owning a pet, owning from a street animal, owning from, from a shelter. Okay, they, they, are, they are nice things, but that's not the main thing. 
for instance, you cannot go in front of a mayor or a governor that that you adopted a, a poor dog from a, from a forest, from from a shelter. They are not affected. They are not influenced. You have to go with your you know background, your your power, your your solutions. Like, for example, we have we have cats living in our in our garden, and we want to get the municipality to. Uh, neuter them. What what do we do? Who do we contact? You will you will directly you will you will directly go to the municipality. They have a veterinary uh, veterinary office, and you will ask them to neuter all those animals. You don't you don't have to pay from your own budget because they have a budget. But you have to show them that they have to do that. That's their duty. That's their duty. You have to. But if you go there as hope as one person. They will not be affected. Probably just after you, they will go to the lunch. They will forget your demand. Mm. They will just do something, okay. you know, symbolically. But if you go there, like let's say, twenty foreigners living in Istanbul and with, with the name of a platform, let's say, they they will remember you after even a couple of weeks later. They will say that okay. foreigners had come and asked to to do that. You know, you have to show them that, for instance, if you are working in 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 a powerful position, let's say if you are working in an embassy, if one of your friends is working in a company, if somebody is a uh, CEO, you know, when you go with your other abilities and they, they afraid from these powers, you know, mm -hmm. I'm afraid it works like that. But um, even, if you're, actually, even if you have power, it, it shouldn't be, you know, in different levels, it should be all together. Okay. Uh, you keep Great. saying talking about using your power. What have you, what um, have you used your power? What are the big? What's the biggest thing you've used your power to achieve for street animals in Turkey? And what are you um, doing right now to uh, make life better for street animals in Turkey and to stop um, like import importing pets? Are you? I mean, are you like lobbying or pushing for higher fees for importing fee importing pets? Um, more taxes on these pets. I mean, what are you, what are you doing right now? How are you using your power right now? For instance, I'll give you just a recent example. Recent example. Uh, as I told you, uh, we have dog trafficking coming to the Turkey, especially from Eastern Europe. These puppies are coming from Bulgaria, Romania, Armenia, from old uh, Iron Curtain countries, especially. Uh, why are they coming from there? Because it's cheap. They, they produced these animals cheaper than producing them in Turkey. So, however, when they are caught in the customs, sometimes, occasionally, they are caught in the customs. Uh, three year, uh, until three years ago, these puppies, which were caught in the customs, uh, were uh, uh, given into the auction. So the pet shops, we're already going to the customs, to Edirne, to uh, uh, to Sarp, to Ankara, to airport, wherever. They go to the auction and they were uh, buying those puppies again. So nothing had changed. Again, these animals were coming into the country. First of all, they were coming, you know, uh, illegally, but by auction, they were coming here legally. So what we did was to speak and to convince the Ministry of Commerce and Customs. We went there, we signed a protocol with the ministry stating out that any puppies, any dogs or cats, even the other animals are caught in the customs. There will be no auction. They will be, these animals are given to the high top free of charge. We take all these animals, take them to the veterinary clinic, and they are paid by the ministry, and we we neut uh, neutralize those animals, and we uh, give to the animal lovers, without without selling them. So it was a great impact on pet shop buyers. So then, in all in, before three years ago, they were expecting these auctions because um, they were making money from that. They buy it for one hundred lira, and they were selling to one thousand dollars in shopping malls. Now today, wherever they are caught in all over the customs officer, they call us 
from the airports, from the uh, land customs officers. Our representatives go there. We take, most of the time they are ill. These animals are ill because they, they come with their illness because they have no vaccination, nothing else. Most of the time, half of them dies on the way. However, the pet shops cannot purchase them anymore. We have the authority as HITAP to have them, to, have, uh, to cure them and to give to animal lovers on the condition that they will not sell to anybody else. We also make a protocol with the animal lovers and we <clears throat> ask them to neuter. So this, how, it, how did it happen? And it didn't happen in one day because we were asking to do, to do this for the last 15 years. Have you thought about neutering before you give to these to the owners and then having them make a donation for the neutering? Uh, we don't take donation because our protocol uh, says that we don't have to take a donation, but we ask because the, these puppies are like two months, one month old. So uh, in, in this see. age, you cannot neuter them because they are very young. That's you have cool. to wait at least six, seven months. So when we give them, we ask them to neuter it. Or if they are old enough, we neuter and we get to them. Since they are, since they are uh, published in newspapers or the televisions, our telephones and mails are <laughs> totally uh, <laughs> locked they, because everybody wants to buy that, that brand name, you know, uh, animals, uh, British and you, uh, and Scottish cats, and you know, cockers. Those. Do you require proof of um, neutering, spayed and neutering? Do you require? Yeah, we follow them. We follow them. Okay. And the ministry follows them. Great. Because they are not supposed to sell it to the third persons again. At, at that time, it doesn't work, you know. Thank, thank For instance, you. This, is, this shows the power of an NGO. One example. I could give you more examples, but this, is, this was the last one. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm going to end with the last question is, how can we help you? Um, you know, how can especially a group of foreigners um, help high tap what can we do uh well there are lots of things i i recommend you to to follow our facebook page first of all the english one uh i'll uh, in in the uh if you give me time i'll give you some links to the chat area okay i'll copy it down uh, the links please follow the, our facebook pages uh, and short movies share them as much as possible and uh, there are some other things, but I don't know if I have time. I can. Well, what, why don't you send them to me, and I will. Um, okay. I will I'll, post them in the various. Yeah, it's better. It's, we will earn time. Uh, I'll give you also the, our English website, so you can see what we are doing and what we are aiming to. Uh, we have also some other donation ways, not by only remitting uh, money, but for instance, we have an like. SOSrooms.com, a web page which is uh, encouraging people to book their hotel rooms over booking.com. At that time, booking.com gives us donation if you make it via SOSrooms.com. I'll send you all the links. There are many things that you can do, but I don't know how how many how uh, how spare time you have, how many minutes you have in your life. There are many things to be done. For instance, uh, you you can say that how do i find all those things well somehow i find even when i'm dreaming i you know always see lots of dreams about animal rights if you have that kind of person i can give you lots of homeworks but if you do it you know uh, just like many other people from time to time i can give you homeworks like that okay. and what i can ask you is that the best thing is that to uh, get together like your feminist group to create a platform with powerful people uh, in, in Istanbul, in Turkey, then when we go to a meeting, when we do something, I will also call you, we will call you to come and join that meeting. Or when you go to the a municipality or a ministry, a powerful position, please go there with the name of your platform, stating out that you are representing, let's say 50, 100 foreigners living in, uh, in Istanbul, the expats. That's that's the, the only way. As I told you, the, Owning a pet is not the solution. It's one one drop of uh, water in, in millions of liters. So that's not the way. So get together, 
we will show you how to convince them. Okay, well, I mean, thank you so, so much for your time. I know we're way over the time and I think we'd all like to listen for, for more time, but we, we know you have things to do and it's probably, well, we still have time for dinner, but um, thank you again. And um, anybody who has any further questions, you can uh, send them to me and we can try to get them answered. But I know you've got a lot of people who are always demanding of your time. So we can try to, uh, just kind of coordinate some things. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of your lockdown. So I've made a recording of this and um, I will share, oh, you know, give me a day or so and I will share everything. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Well,